The treaty negotiations of 1921 have received extensive scholarly examination. So too has the life of Michael Collins and his relationship with Kitty Kiernan. Yet we sometimes forget that the events which comprised these stories did not occur exclusively of one another. In fact, each of these narratives was likely to have impacted the other. Presented in the context of the events that surrounded their composition, these are the letters of Michael Collins and Kitty Kiernan. Michael Collins arrived in London in the early morning of October 10th, 1921. He was about to begin the negotiation that would define his political career and the future of an entire nation. If such a task were not daunting enough, Collins sought to undertake these complex negotiations at the very moment that his personal life was also entering its most complex and yet fulfilling phase. It was at around this time that Michael Collins had become engaged to Kitty Kiernan. Collins and Kiernan had first met in Kiernan's home at Granard County Longford when Collins had visited the town in support of Joe McGuinness's by-election campaign in May of 1917. The two struck up an acquaintance at this time, but do not seem to have become romantically attached until the summer of 1921. In November of 1920, though, Collins had severely reprimanded Sean McOwen, Brigade OC of the North Longford IRA, for having had the assassination of a senior RIC officer carried out in Kiernan's family home and business, the Greville Arms Hotel. Throughout the summer of 1921, Collins and his friend Harry Boland maintained separate correspondence with Kiernan, with each of them attempting to forge a romantic relationship with her. By early October, Boland seemed confident that he would attain her consent to marriage, but Kiernan remained unsure. Boland set out on a diplomatic mission to the US on October 3rd. By then, it seems, he was so convinced he would attain Kiernan's hand in marriage that he had informed his mother that they were engaged. Boland's mother wrote her congratulations to Kiernan on October 4th. Although Kiernan's correspondence with Boland makes it clear that they were not yet engaged, and that Boland himself must have been the source of his mother's misunderstanding, the Longford woman did nothing to disabuse Boland of the notion that he may yet marry her, even as her understanding with Collins evolved into something much more solid. Having begun the Anglo-Irish negotiations on October 11th, Collins and the Irish delegation were aware that the British were keen to have their military and security concerns addressed in any settlement. There had also been some discussion of free trade, and the Irish delegation had voiced their concerns regarding foreign goods traded by British merchants and the necessity to protect fledgling Irish industry from such competition. The following morning, Collins went to Mass at Brompton Oratory and then went in search of Kiernan's communication. To his distress, he found none. Kit dear, I've just returned from the Brompton Oratory. I was late for Mass a little, but the care hadn't come, and I didn't know the way very well. Lit a candle for you, a very big one. I did the same yesterday morning. After I'd been to the oratory yesterday, I did a journey of five miles to my sister's place for a letter from you. No letter. Honestly, I felt it terribly, but I do not believe that you have failed to write and won't believe it until I know. Saw Helen and Paul last night. We'd quite a little party. These two, Sean and Murahilla, Mr and Mrs Duggan, self and my sister, had dinner with Helen and Paul and went to a show afterwards. I'd have given anything to have had you there. Alas, I kind of told Helen. I fancy they'd all be very pleased. What do you think? Goodbye for the day. Tough work before me. Every good wish and thought. Me all. And also sent a telegram. Having dispatched his complaints to Kiernan, Collins took his queer mood off to negotiations where, during a testy sub-conference, he and General Neville MacReady accused each other's forces of several breaches of the truce. By the end of the day, he was in little doubt that the British were seriously annoyed at some very public breaches of the truce by some IRA units, and he later opined that such behaviour almost collapsed the negotiations. It is likely that he returned home in sombre mood. At some point during this day, Collins dispatched another letter to Kiernan. 
Although it does not survive, it would seem that it urged her to provide Boland with more clarity as to the nature of their relationship. Before she received what may have been an instructive letter from Collins, Kiernan had already dispatched a long letter to London. Collins did not receive it and read its contents until the following morning. My very dear Michael, ever since I saw you last, I've been thinking of you. And now I just want to write you a very nice letter. At least one that you will like. But I don't know what to say. Your letter was a dote and you know that I liked it. All came together yesterday, no post Sundays, and it was a very great post for me. Shop was full of people and I didn't want to look excited, so I only read them two times until evening and they did cheer me up and yet made me lonely. I felt I wanted you. Ever since I came back, I miss you and realise how very happy I am while I'm with you. After all, I suppose that is everything, although sometimes there seems to be insurmountable difficulties. Things keep coming into my head. I don't want to make this a long, uninteresting letter. Otherwise, I could write for hours. But your kitty speechless. Your little note was lovely too, and what made me happiest of all was a thought. It made me feel that it required no effort to write it, and you really felt it. That pleased me most. So you liked my little scribble, but I did spoil it by telling. My next delight was that you slept. It means such a lot. I think, and you went off in great form. If only you could continue to make me happy by sleeping more and more. After a while, it would come quite easy to you. I got home safely. Lara, Chris and Tom met me in Mullingar. A surprise for me, and we motored home. I felt so tired and got to bed around 12 o'clock as there was a visitor, an old friend here. On Sunday, I stayed in bed instead of going to early mass. I never awoke, and all Sunday, I never sat down with the visitors. Dr and Mrs Delaney and company. So I got no chance of writing even a line to you, both rooms being in occupation. Monday was our busy day in the shop, and no Helen, so I decided to wait until today to write. I've only just got back from Mass. I offered Holy Communion for you, lit a candle and prayed that God may keep you in his love and do what's best for Ireland. Will you keep your promise no matter what happens to go to confession and communion? If I thought you would, I'd feel quite content and satisfied. Thank God who gives us both what we deserve. Up to this, he's been almost too good to me and the way I treated him. Of course, I want him still to be good to me, even though I don't deserve it. And I feel if you are good, he'll appreciate it more than you. And it is a lovely feeling that I've got. Confidence that he will watch over you. My very dear love, I'm sorry for making a sermon of my letter or for making it appear that I'm preaching to you, especially as I started the letter by wishing that I might be able to write you a nice one. This is anything but nice. However, it is well to be able to be sincere, at least with me. And if I didn't write as I feel, I wouldn't be. You are the one that I feel like this about, in the ordinary way. I admit my faults. It would be no effort to write a love letter, even if I didn't feel it, just for the fun of the thing. But with you, it is sincere, heartfelt. I suppose there was no necessity to say this, seeing that you know me inside and out, but it wouldn't be Kitty if she didn't say and do the wrong thing sometime. You will, I know, forgive this, as you always overlook all those little things about me. I started this letter with mixed feelings of happiness and sadness, not knowing where exactly you are and what you are doing just now. But I do hope you are safe and well. I am just silly about the little watch. haven't taken it off my arm yet. Indeed, there was no necessity to tell me to listen to its little tick. I had the little kiddie Lil in last evening. I brought her toys from Bannerher. So I said, look what I brought you from Dublin, pointing to the watch. Her eyes lit up. So I said, little Lil, there's not the slightest chance you're getting this. And that gave me great satisfaction. Now, wasn't it evil of me? I have just got, when starting this letter, a wire from Harry from New York. He's safely there. I'll say goodbye for today. We'll write every day now. And if it's short, you won't mind when it's every day. Because I didn't write for two days, I wrote longer so you don't have to read so much anymore. I wish you everything that will please you and make you happy. Be assured that if you meet someone you like, etc., that it will make me happy to know that she is the right one. After all, how does one know? And not for one second think it would worry me if you were happy. Please remember this. Thanks for the loan. Did you pay the three pence for me? Bye-bye.
Good luck. Le Grau, your own kid. The letter lifted Colin's spirits and he immediately wrote a hasty reply. Kid dearest, you will know from my wire yesterday that I'd gotten into a state of great concern about not hearing from you. Now I'm all right as I've got your letters. They arrived late last night and I picked them up after mass this morning. Even if yours had not come, I'd write you this morning. This must be short, although there are many things I'd like to say. However, you know what I have on my hand just now, and I want you to know that you are in my mind, and I think of you every moment I am free. I was in a queer mood on Tuesday, probably a bit unstrung when I wrote that, what must appear to you to be a hectoring letter, yet I'll say nothing more of it. You will often be called on to stand a lot for me also, but then straightforwardness and understanding. No. Don't think I resent your sermon. It's a queer thing, but I feel very like that, and I've often felt that it required someone like you to make me appreciate the thing properly. I must say I feel appreciation coming. You'll be glad to know that I'm sleeping and keeping in very good form. This is really true, and I tell you so that you won't be worrying. Now another thing. What I meant by restraint was less excitement, earlier hours, not just your meaning. It has worked out and you've done it. I really liked your letters. Always write as you feel, to me at any rate. I'll do the same to you. I've lighted a candle for you at the Brompton Oratory each morning. Of course I paid that threepence. Why did you send me back the pound? With all my love, Michal. I was so glad you liked that note written in the Gresham on the 9th of October. That was more spontaneous on my part and came from a very great longing. We must, I think, make that arrangement more binding, but just as you desire. I feel somehow that it'll work out, and work out well. Slán lát. M. The change in Colin's mood may have been evident during the negotiations. October 13th was one of those days when he was in one of his more boisterous moods. It was on this day that Collins was reported to have seen an ornamental gun in Downing Street and asked, what is the meaning of this provocative display? It was said that he even suggested posing in an armchair with the gun and having Lloyd George invite the press to photograph him. Some of the British delegation found some of Collins's jokes to be awkward and unamusing, but on October 13th, 1921, they couldn't have been aware that much of the lift in his mood was probably caused by his receipt of Kiernan's letter. After a day during which the Attorney-General outlined the legal position of potential treaty ports using South Africa's Simonstown as a precedent, and First Sea Lord outlined his tactical assessment of the necessity of such ports, Collins returned home and completed a more substantial reply to Kiernan. This time, he even expanded his negotiation with her by addressing her concerns about the exclusivity of his commitment. My dear, dear Kit, this note is certainly going to be short. Several people waiting for me in a conference at eleven have just come back from Mass, lit a candle for you as I do each morning. I don't know how many times I've read your letter. It's awfully good and I do really love it. Your rebuke, for it is just ever so little rebuke, about someone else who would really be the one as a little upsetting. You don't mean it like that, though, I'm sure. You are the one. Never fear. How I wish I could see you now and have one of those lovely, serious talks with you. They're the best ones, aren't they? Parts of your letter were somewhat like them. You'll never know what good that letter did me yesterday. It helped me all through the day, and it was one of the hardest days we have yet had. Had it from early morning until late almost, and you don't know what an ordeal that is. Slán lát for the day. I'm looking forward to a letter in half an hour. God be with you. Fondest love. M. Do you like my letters, or only some of them? Collins's days wouldn't get any shorter or easier. The weight of the conference continued to bear on him, particularly as he and Griffith were cast, or cast themselves, in the roles of lead negotiators. His correspondence with Kiernan continued in increasingly loving terms, yet Kiernan also seemed in occasional need of reassurance as to the level of Colin's commitment. Thus, as their letters continued their crisscrossing of the Irish Sea, 
Collins and Kiernan negotiated their future in the light of increasing love and affection.